So I'm here at the Sheep Show with Phil Benson, and Philip is Zamberlin, USA. That's Philip is Zamberlin, That's how USA. I know you. Yeah. That's how I know you. Um, and I've been working with Philip now for for a while. The whole boot thing has been a you know a real. If you're a mountain hunter, boots are so important. And today I get to. Uh, Hang out in Philip's booth, and we're just gonna, uh, we're just gonna, kind of. There's a few questions apparently that have come yeah. in, and we're just yeah. gonna talk. The uh, Sheep Show, 2023, and it's it's been it's been great so far. So Philip, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, this is a it's it's a pleasure to be here with you, at uh, in Reno at the Sheep Show, and let's uh, let's get into it. Yeah, let's do it. Thanks for thanks for coming here, Greg, and. For those in our audience and the Zomberlin audience who may not be familiar with uh, with you, Greg McHale, maybe give us a little bit of an introduction real quick as we get started about who you are, you know, how long you've been hunting, what types of hunt do you like to do, and what is Greg McHale all about? Right. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> what, is your, what is your essence? Where, where, yeah, where do we start? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I live in the Yukon, and I do most of my hunting, um, all backcountry, obviously. Um, my real passion is for sheep, um, hence the sheep show. This is like, this is where I, I love to be. This is my crowd. Um, mountain hunting, backpack, remote, all self, you know, self-supported, no, um, yeah, no guides, no, none of that, none of that because I live there. So I have the ability to be able to uh, just get out in the back country with my team and I, we have a television show, Greg McHale's Wild Yukon, which is going into season seven now. Fantastic. Uh, we're pretty excited about, about that. We have some great partners along with yourself. So yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell where we live and hunt in the Yukon and, and just try to push it physically as, as hard as we can as a team and really get back a little bit further than most. That's, that's what we love to do. That's great. So how did you get started sheep hunting? I think where did that come from? Who got you into it? And uh, how has that evolved over time? Yeah, got it. getting into sheep hunting from, I grew up in Ontario, so it was about as far removed from sheep country as you could possibly be in our country. Mm -hmm. Sure. So <laughs> after university, yeah. uh, my wife now, girlfriend at the time, we kind of packed up her little car, her little car, because I didn't have one. And um, we moved out, out to the Yukon for wild places and in search of adventure, really. I was a hunter back home, and one of the first jobs that I looked for was in the hunting industry. It didn't, uh, it didn't come easily. I think I applied to every outfitter in the Yukon and was turned down, <laughs> and, but I would kept, kept up the persistence because nobody, you know, nobody at that time was gonna take a chance on a guy that knew nothing about mountain sure. hunting come from flatland country, uh, but, I did, but I did end up getting a job with Arctic Red River who, in Northwest Territories, who is, you know, they're so well known for their sheep hunting and just the wild country that, that they have up there in the Mackenzie Mountains. Um, the first outfitter that took a, took a chance on me was Kelly Hogan, so I try to give him a shout out because he started it all. Uh, took a chance on a, you know, a, a skinny kid coming uh, coming into the into the country and I just I just, I told him I knew and that was great for me because I knew nothing about horses but um, Arctic Red River was all backpack hunting oh, yeah. so I just said I can carry a pack mm -hmm. and not really knowing what the mountain environment but coming from an athletic background and knew that I was just gonna not quit right. and do as do as good a job as I could possibly do so that's where it all started. It started kind of at the sharp end, getting to be a, a packer for, uh, for the most part, you know, American hunters that came yeah. in to yeah. fulfill their life's dreams of a, of a doll sheep hunt. Yeah. And that's, that's where I started to learn how to hunt. I had some great mentors along the way, some of the, you know, some of the best sheep hunters out there. There's kind of guys like Alex Van Bibber, who's just like an old time, Yukon outfitter and I was it's an honor like he's passed away now but an honor to be able to have spend time in a camp with a guy like that um, Al Clausen uh, another Yukon 
longtime UConner, and he still guides. Just, just these great guys were mentors, and that's kind of how I got into it. What a great place to start. I mean, if, I mean to, to, to be who you are today, and you look back at that history and that first start in the hunting industry, I mean, it, it, it explains a lot about you today. I mean, it really does. Well, what I, I re relate it back to, if, you, if you're surrounded by the best, you can only be elevated. Mm -hmm. um, that's started off, you know, a kind of a mindset of those, those guys that, you know, are so successful in the hunting industry, um, so successful in the guiding world. It's, mm -hmm. So to be taught by them is, is you know, it's absolutely an, an honor. And I tried to take away as much as I could at that young age um, and, you know, take it to where I could. And yeah, and this, you know, this industry is an industry of passion, right? And when you have that, you have that circumstance where it's, you look at hunting and, and how many people are, 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 how many hunters are so passionate about it and it becomes their lives. And you think about them wanting to be a part of this industry and the, the, that really creates a lot of barriers. So if you want to work in this industry, I mean, you have to, you have to fight for it. You have to really want it. Yeah, it's, um, sheep hunting is, the, once somebody does it, um, I don't like. I don't know anybody that's done it once mm -hmm. and says, "Oh, I don't ever want to do that again." <laughs> like, no matter how hard it was, because right. that's the that's the thing about mountain hunting and sheep hunting is it's about pushing yourself and kind of, in, in a lot of ways, people find out who they are. Yes. To whether it's good or it's bad, yes. but generally speaking, you know, you walk away from a sheep hunt, successful or not, and you go, "Okay." That was, that was different. Yes, and you know, as, a, as, a, as a backpack bow hunter myself, I mean, I remember, you know, just, I've been a hunter my whole life, but I didn't start backpack, backcountry bow hunting until a few years ago. And you go through that first trip and it just, it absolutely breaks you, right? And you step away from it, you have to step away for a few days and you're like, man, I gotta get back. I gotta right. do it again, I gotta get better. Here's all the things I need to improve at. Here's what I need to learn. And you realize after that first trip, just how much of a barrier there is to get to that level, that next level where you're consistently successful. Yeah. Consistently harvesting, I should say. Yeah. Right? So what do you consider a successful hunt? Do you have to harvest to be successful? You know, generally speaking, I would I would say yes I do, because obviously there are so many components to to satisfaction of the hunt. Mm. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, I'm a very competitive person, mm -hmm. and my interest is I'm not going out there to to not, you know, take that animal. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate. That's the ultimate goal at the end of the day. That's the is, mindset. Is 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 the mindset? Um, do I if if it doesn't happen, do I consider it uh, an unsuccessful trip? Not necessarily, because there are all those other components that make up, right. you know, what it is to have a great hunt whether it's the, the physical difficulty, whether it's you know, spending time in the field with great people, mm -hmm. um, you know, the beautiful environment that you're in. But at, when it all boils down, I'm there to achieve a goal. Mm -hmm. And that goal being to take you know, whatever animal it is that I'm looking for. Um, so there are degrees of success, but you know, in my mind, it is to, to achieve the, the complete success of the hunt, there has to be, you know, at the end of the day, I've got to be walking out with a heavy pack. And to and to get to that level, the the amount of preparation that goes into it is, I mean, it's it's tremendous, right? And I know you take a lot of pride in your physical preparation, right? Um, and you know, seemingly in your mental preparation as well to get to get to get ready to be consistently performing and to be ready for no matter what the mountain throws at you, right on a hunt, to have no excuses, right? To be to be ready for whatever it takes. What are some of the things that you're doing to get ready physically and mentally and otherwise so that you can hit that level? And what would you recommend to others that are, you know, listening into this? You know, what can they take away? Yeah, the mountain, um, the mountain hunting environment, if you want to be consistently successful to the degree that I'm talking about, which is walking out with a heavy pack, you have to you have to be able to walk into that environment physically prepared for it, mm -hmm. okay? Which means you, you have to be training all year round. And the guys that show up 
and they'd started, started training you know, a month, a couple weeks ahead of time. Inevitably, there are going to be, Mother Nature is going to throw stuff at you that is going to break down the mind first. Yeah. And you're, you're going to be tired, you're not going to be physically, you know, going to be exhausted, and then that, that part cr breaks, breaks it down and creeps into your mind, and that's an easy way, easy way out. Because once, once you get, start walking up that first mountain with the full pack, you're going to know, am I ready for this or am I not? Mm -hmm. and, and if you... It doesn't have, take long. No, if you had <laughs> set the groundwork of preparing all year round for this, then that's not going to be part of your mindset that, that, that you're, you're physically not there. So that's where it starts. Um, like mindset for me, I've always been about pushing my, my physical body in the most, I know, the most adverse conditions. And that's, I, did a, I had a professional adventure racing career and that's the ultimate, the ultimate proving ground for whether you can handle the mental toughness of the natural environment. So you, you adventure racing, tell us a little bit about that. What did that entail, what were you doing? Yeah, so adventure racing is a team sport of four people and the kind of style that we raced was uh, called expedition style, which is like 400 to 1,000 kilometer races, generally speaking. Nice, okay. So multiple days, Right. You know, you start at the, and what you have to do is you have to navigate map and compass across where, across terrain that generally we're all over the world, so I've never been there before. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to read a map mm -hmm. and, and use a compass to navigate, you know, the bush in, right. in places that you, you've probably, you know, I live in the Yukon, so, you know, if I'm doing it in the desert environment or the jungle environment or whatever, you're out of your element. Right. So that, that in and of itself is, and then you go in there as a team, and then you're racing nonstop for multiple days with the exception of you know, an hour and a half sleep every 24 hours. Wow. And that sleep is usually, you, know, you, you grab your garbage bag and it's you know, in the bush. Yeah. You throw your garbage bag over top of you for a little bit of warmth, and you know, and that's that's what you've got. You sleep for an hour and a half. You get up and you continue. So Amazing. it breaks it breaks the body down, and, and as much as anything, it's a mental game. So that's where I really honed my mental skills of being able to deal with anything out in the hunting environment. So very interesting. So there's you're not talking about like meditation or other things that you're doing mentally. It's really pushing yourself over the edge physically to condition your mind over time to be used to that, right? To, to accept that discomfort, to embrace it, so to speak. Embracing the, you know, the difficulty, as we say. Yeah, embracing the suck, the is, suck is, yeah. Is, is, is one of those terms. Right. But it's, I think, that success, um, whether it's business, whether it's you know, a, a racing environment, whether it's hunting, if you seek out the thing about me is I've always sought out difficulty, mm -hmm. um, usually it, manifest, manifesting itself in um, physical difficulty. But if you seek it out, because the world we live in right now is nothing but like pleasure seeking, right. and let's make everything easier. Right. The superpower is when you choose to make things difficult for yourself, to find out who you are. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that that's necessarily found in, you know, in working out for an hour in the gym. Right. You take that into the natural environment mm -hmm. where you can't control anything. Right. Like, you know, you go to the gym and you can control the temperature, you know, you can put the nice fan on yourself, you can right. control all these things to, to build. The weight, the yeah. sets, whatever it is. But yeah. you get out into, into the nature and all that still helps you, right? It still helps you prepare to get absolutely. you ready physically, but yeah. yeah, I'm not discounting discounting that. Obviously, I spent a lot of time in the gym, and but where where the mental preparation side really comes is putting yourself in the difficult situations within the environment that you're going to be mm. that you that you want to achieve the goal in. So for me, that reminds me of a book by Ryan Holiday called "The Obstacle Is the Way." Okay. I don't know if you're familiar no, with that. No, I'm not. That's the whole topic of the book, is putting yourself, you know, uh, instead of avoiding 
the, the, the difficult obstacle, using that as your path forward yeah. because that invariably will lead to the return that you're looking for in your time and your effort in your life. Yeah. So just very, very similar to your life. Yeah, when you, when you seek difficult situations for yourself, it's, it's only going to provide something that you can't get otherwise. Or don't avoid them, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. But not even, not even don't avoid them. You, like, you must look for them. Like actively put yourself right. in these situations. Like go for a run when it's raining. Yeah. Like if, because when, when you're sitting out on the side of the mountain and it starts raining, and if you haven't built that mental domination, right. Then you, it's going. That's where the creep comes in. The oh, it's, I'm wet. Yes. Oh, it's cold. You went the oh, mindset it's... that no matter what's going on around you, you're calm. Your operations have made you ready for that moment. Yeah. And your plan is going forward as planned. You're not changing, right? Yeah. You're still there. You're not saying, okay, well, it's raining. I got a bolt. No, I made the decision. I made the dedication to this hunt. No excuses. This is how I'm going to be successful this time. Maybe on my next hunt, it'll be a little different. This time, this is what I've got, and I've got to get through it. Exactly. Very good. I, you know, running is a big part of your preparation. That's very interesting. A lot of guys are, are, you see, you hear about this in the industry, a lot of guys doing more and more trail running as preparation, whereas I think, you know, you still see a lot of guys out there that using primarily like lift, weightlifting as their, their primary means of preparation for the hunt. Yeah. You know, so I think that's really interesting that you've got that adventure racing background and, you know, just looking at you as a, as you know, physically as a person, you're very trim, right? You can tell you're solid, you're very strong, but you know, there isn't, you don't have a lot of excess weight on yourself, right? So that shows in you. Yeah, I think for, for me, what is really is, is the, what I believe is the ultimate mountain body is one that is not carrying a whole lot of muscle mass mm -hmm. because in the in the mountain hunting environment when you have to you can have to go day after day I talked to a fellow today that was on a sheep hunt 28 days wow and he's had to you know you got to move that body through the mountains up and down and it's the caloric requirements of that I mean the caloric expenditure in the mountains is so high already yeah and then, so for, for me, it's like the endurance factor is, is the most important factor. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you have to be strong enough to be able to carry the weight of your pack and carry, obviously, a heavier pack on the way out. Mm -hmm. But really, it's day after day being able to grind, grind it out, and endurance is, is the key for me. Like, there's... It's ultimately what really matters. But, and most people, I think, are really pushing a lot of weight. Now, don't, don't get me wrong that I don't, um, I don't push weight in the gym because I want to be strong. I want to be able to pick that pack up and be able to right. move it around. And yeah. when it is time to come out with that 100-pound pack, you got to be strong, too. No, it's very obvious. You, 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 you have your strength element is, is there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely there. So you have a program, though, right? You have a program that you follow. So we have, yeah, I mean, my wife and I have put together what we believe is certainly a, a great foundational program to get a person prepared for a mountain hunt. Mm -hmm. and, all, and a lot of that program is based, and we, want it, we built it specifically for, for people that, um, that are really wanting to, to get, to enter into the mountain hunting world for sure, but and it's, and it's certainly um, based off of body weight exercises so that you don't have to have a gym in order to be able to get, because I, I have a small gym at my house, but a lot of the stuff that I do is really, if, I, if you move your body in different, different directions and you get some cardio doing it and then you add to that you know, some real cardio, mm -hmm. I think that's the ultimate, um, it's gonna be ultimately prepare you for, for the mountains. And uh, you don't need to have this, you know, a, a membership and to a gym, I don't believe. Like, because I live in the Yukon right. and I've never spent any time in, you know, in a gym, the gym setting. Right. Um, because, and I think that, I mean, success is, uh, is built in the preparation and you can do it without, uh, without a big gym. 
And as long as you have the mindset and you get yourself into those adverse conditions in mother nature, is going to be the foundation to make you successful in the mountains. That's excellent. So I, you mentioned your wife. Yeah. And I'm also, I, we were talking the other day and you had mentioned bringing your son up as well mm -hmm. and getting him into mountain hunting. And I, I've seen him on your on your social as well. You walk into the gym, you hit the wall, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, and, and you guys are ready to go. Tell us about that. What's it like, you know, bringing your son into the fold? and how's he responding to it, and what would you recommend to others that are you know, trying to do the same, trying to instill that passion in their, in their kids? Yeah, it's so, it's like, when you, when you even mention it, I kind of light up because right. um, there's nothing, as, as a parent, like I raced all over the world pre-children, and you know, obviously trying to accomplish things for myself, and it was really like, go, 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 not just myself, but my wife and I, who was a tremendous athlete, and you're very, you're very tunnel vision, but mm -hmm. you have kids and things change. Mm -hmm. So what I, when my son was on his first sheep hunt at seven years old with my, with my father, and he was in his 70s, um, so it was a, a, just an amazing experience to be able to take out this little guy that knows nothing, mm -hmm. and you know, he's relying on, on you to make all the right decisions, to, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, willing to go because he trusts that, that I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it all happen. Or not, right. necessarily, not necessarily in taking a ram, but just we're gonna have this experience that I believe he can do. And mm -hmm. most people would say, oh, a seven-year-old on a sheep hunt, that's, you know, that's kind of crazy. But um, fortunately, we have two, you know, very driven children. Um, I have a daughter that's uh, seven, and her name is Yari, and Coulter, he's now 10. But on, her, on that first sheep hunt with him, um, we've, been, we've been kind of cultivating this atmosphere within our family of what I call mental domination, and he, well, both of them are really, um, really picking up on it, and he just, he's the kind of kid that puts his head down, and he just goes. I, I, the, the greatest moment for me on that sheep hunt with him, besides obviously the three of us, my father took a sheep, and the three of us you know, all experienced that together. But the, great, the proudest moment for me is on that hunt, is we were heading, the, the sheep was in our packs, and my son had a, uh, a boned out hindquarter in his pack with his, you know, his stuff. I was carrying, like he was just had a sleeping bag and just like some light stuff and I was carrying the rest, but he's seven here. Right. Um, he had a boned out uh, hind quarter of a sheep and he carried this back to, you know, back to the airplane. And at, at one time, it, you know, it's raining out, we're in the willows and the willows are over my head and I'm shuttling back and forth to get, to take my pack up and then I would shuttle back and get my dad's pack. Mm -hmm. And then I would move that pack and by that time he would get there. Right. And all, the, all this time, you know, as I would go back, my son would just continue on. Yes. Through the willows, in the soak, it's pouring out through the rain, just put his head down and, you know, I said, go toward that mountain. So he could see that, the top of that mountain in the mm -hmm. distance. And there was one time where I had to, I felt too long for my comfort and I'm standing on the top of a boulder and trying to look through the, look over the, the buck right. brush and in the alder to see movement of alder. And I can <laughs> see like, you know, 100 yards up there, there's this little guy Something. by himself just moving through the alder and you can I just kind of see it. I can imagine the pride that you're feeling at that point. So, so this, in, this little guy gets it. Um, he, get, he has something that I didn't have and, and maybe because of I wasn't pushed in the same in the mm -hmm. same way that uh, that I think that we're pushing him or giving him these experiences, but you know this this kid wakes up now at uh, now he's to set his alarm for 5 a.m. It used to be 5:30, and I used to be able to get up at 4:30 and you know get a get a 45 minutes of a workout in mm -hmm. before he comes down, <laughs> but now he sets his alarm at five, and I'm like. Man, you're killing me. Now alarm. I got to get up at four <laughs> because right. like, his alarm goes, goes off and yeah. you know, he gets himself dressed, comes down to the gym, 
and so and he's ready to go and then we're out to the skating rink or whatever because he's a big hockey player he loves hockey so nice. that's his nice. passion so I that's understand the kind that of problem kid. right I have to get up earlier and earlier every day it seems as well to be able to go down to the garage get my workout in get on the treadmill whatever yeah because as soon as he realizes it that I'm down there and I'm out working out, he's got to be there too. Yeah, right? And he's that's, only four. That's right. Cool. So he loves to come down and peek out the door and go, morning, daddy. Yeah. Are you working out? <laughs> yeah. And that, that's, that's super prideful, I think, when, mm -hmm. you know, when the kids are seeing you. Cause I, I think that a lot of parents, and this is it, this is my theory, a lot, like kids are so smart. They see what you're doing as a parent and when it becomes when just physical activity is just part of what part of our lifestyle they want to do that because they want to yes. emulate dad like good or bad it's powerful good it's good powerful. or yeah. bad mm -hmm. and That's i right. think that um and not, not just dad but mom as well um you know our kids are watching and it's up to us to build the best human for the next generation that we possibly can. And that's why I believe that physical fitness and outdoor environments are just where we need to be, you know, to be taking our kids because be They're damned so if ideal. I have a 30 year old playing video games in my basement. <laughs> like, and, right. and that's, the, that's the way I see the world going. You, you know, and, and it's, you know, when you think about it from just a mental development perspective, physical activity and being in the outdoors, I mean, those are two of the healthiest things human beings can do, yeah. regardless of age. But instilling at them in a young age, going up and developing those habits, that will stay with them forever. Forever, it's such a gift. Yeah. It's such a gift. I so, think the three basic things of, of life that we're all, um, to me, it's, it's, it's health is number one. Mm. Relationships are number two. Mm. If you have your health and your relationships intact, in then number three, you can worry about your, like, your finances. Mm. Um, because if you have those two things taken care of, the finances are gonna come. Mm -hmm. Because you've got good people around you mm -hmm. that, that you love and that, you love, you know, that love you, and now you've got this support mechanism to go, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. And then it's about you know, taking, care of, taking care of those people around you through the financial, because we all wanna be able to to not worry about that. Yeah, you've got to have those capacities down, right? You have to be there. You've got to get your tools sharpened. You got to be ready for the fight day yeah. in and day out. So, yeah, I agree. So, so, so part of health is nutrition, right? Um, and if you look at, you know, being a consistent harvester of game, you know, you look at game meats, very nutritious. As good as it gets. As good as it gets. Are you a good cook? Ooh. <laughs> what do you do with your meat? Who's preparing it? Is it more your wife? Is it you? Um, so if you ask my kids, am I a good cook? They would be like, yes, 100%. If you ask anybody else, um, because all I do, the only cooking I do, generally speaking, is meat. Um, okay, yes. So, and my kids. Similar we, in our family. <laughs> yeah, we, we very much, um, we very much, eat what I would what I would consider um, like whole foods you know if you if you can't rec if your great grandmother doesn't recognize what it is mm. we uh, it probably doesn't hit our house mm. so my wife is a great cook um, but she doesn't uh, she's like she leaves the meat department to me um, so I mean she'll ground meat and whatever put it into whatever she's making but um, yeah, when it comes to like steaks and stuff, right. I'm the, I'm the go-to in the house, and and the, <laughs> we don't we surprisingly or not, uh, we don't eat. I wouldn't say that meat is the the it is definitely not the number one component of our meals. Right. Um, we we know where our bodies are at, and my my body requires about you know that maybe 10 to 15 percent what I would consider. Um, you know, the meat requirement, and everything else is just kind of whole foods, and mm -hmm. you know, a uh, lot of, lot of plant-based, and, and it's just natural foods. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the, the ultimate, I think, diet that you can have, because you can buy so much, sh you know, shit out there that you don't even know what it is, right? right. 
But if you, if you go to the grocery store and you, know, you can recognize it, then eat it. Mm -hmm. Right? If you can name it. If you can name it and it, it's, it's <laughs> grown or it. if it's grown or you took it out of the, out of the mountains yourself. Right. Um, and my favorite would be bison. Oh. Yeah. How do you they, prepare it? Uh, every way, really. For, like we have bison chilies and stews, like ground meat. Um, obviously the great cuts go into steaks and, mm -hmm. and then uh, and that's where the kids just start to, uh, they, as soon as I'm cooking steaks, it's like the eyes light up. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny because it, it is such yeah. a natural thing, Very. like to want to eat. Very. And this is where I really realize it because we've gone through these cycles, um, you know, trying different foods and really what, um, you know, a really, a very much a plant-based diet. We've kind of went through a phase of that, but when, and I shouldn't say, it's not a phase, it's more, more trying to figure things out as mm -hmm. to, uh, as good, to, how you doing? good, how are you, buddy? Um, you know, trying to figure things out, what works best with the body. Right. And, and, but when you, with, when you taste bison mm. that has been, you know, with the, the proper, you know, sauces and, or like the proper rubs and like what I call proper, like tasty. Um, <laughs> and like the kids just literally, like something primal comes out, is like, right. I want this. Yes. And yes. so it's, it's now we, we really get, our family really gets where we are with, um, with, with the whole meat and the whole whole foods thing yep. and how, it, how our bodies perform best at it. And I think that that comes with a lot of trial and error and as long as, but not so much error if you're not eating processed foods. Like right. it's more just trial and what your body um, right. adapts to and what, how your body performs best and with what foods they, they do that with. And right. we know for our family. Yeah, it's incredible to see the kids um, you know, because I, I experience the same thing with my son when we make him when I grill steak for him, he just he he gets so excited and he runs in the house. He's like, "Mommy, mommy, we're eating steak tonight!" Like yeah. it's primal. It's it is very, literally primal. It's in our DNA. Yeah, that probably helps that that was the very first solid food that he ever ate. <laughs> steak. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but he yeah, I, I I totally get it. So. All right, so that's this is good. This gives us a really nice, you know, holistic approach to who Greg McHale is. Let's talk a little bit more about your preparation, uh, you know, for the hunt, specifically around gear, you know, and you know, obviously you're working with with Zomberlin, a boot company. We can talk about your favorite boot here in a little bit. But what other gear are you kind of geeking out about, and, and what's important to you in your preparations? Yeah, geeking out about so I'm I'm not one of those guys that that really geeks out about about gear because mm -hmm. at at the end of the day ultimately if your body is ready and your and your mental preparation is there um, it really like it really wouldn't matter you're going to achieve the goal mm -hmm. but at the same time it's I good gear is so important and it it lit well. It just makes it makes things. It certainly makes things easier, um, and makes allows you to go longer and further before that mental preparation ever would break down. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you start to combine these two right. of mental dominance and amazing gear, yeah. and now you've got a recipe that just okay. We there there are no limits. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's a lot of you know a lot of great things, and obviously. Boots is a huge component to being able to uh, to staying. You know, you guys used to back in the day used to wear you know, gum boots like in in the mountains. Now, would they be able? Would those same guys be able to uh, achieve or go as far and as long, or would they even think to do so as as us today? Um, the answer to that, I believe, is is no. Now, having said that, their their hunts. Use like in the 1920s, those guys were clearly hard, hard men, right? Right, in a, in a in a different aspect, but because when you go on a hunt like that in back in 100 years ago, you were going for a month, right. so so you knew like this is going to be a, a long grind out, and we're gonna you Get know exposed right without the security technologies that we have today, yeah. the GPSs, whatever the you know there's 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 so much that goes to enabling mm -hmm. somebody being 
as far back in the backcountry for as long as you are, you know, in a safe way that didn't yeah. exist then. That's right. right. So I have made like great admiration for those pioneers, mm. right? Um, and, and the way in which it. they did it. But at the, at the same time, those guys also had the best of the gear that they could have back in that day. Right. So we were all doing the same thing, right? right? Like, okay, if a pair of wool pants is the best, is the best gear 100 right. years ago, well, Wax you're gonna have, yeah. you're gonna have the best wool pants mm -hmm. that, that money could buy back then. Mm -hmm. So nothing has changed in that regard. Right. It's, and now the gear is so technical and we just don't spend that much time in the, in the back country because I think you have great, as, as those trips, because mm -hmm. they don't exist anymore, right. pretty much. Right. Um, and we have, we have such access to it, whether it's like me with airplanes, or um, would I love to go and do, my, my ultimate dream would be to go and do um, one of those one month long hunts where you harvest all of these animals and you do it in you know, the kind of gear of, of the 1920s in that period and, right. and just go and push it and you could see. could still wear a Zomberlin boot if it was gear from the 20s. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and there are not many, there are not many a companies out there They're that a can say, right. right. Um, but you know, when, when we look back in history and we admire these kind of pioneers, um, you know, if you're worth your salt, I think sometimes you kind of, you kind of go, hey, I wonder how I would have done back then. Right. And th right. those are the kind of things that that I think about. And would I have gravitated toward that? Right. Had I been? I know I would have. Mm. Like because you don't take the passion, or once you get a taste of these. For me, once I got a taste of, well, I had to move six thousand kilometers in search of adventure mm. to one of the wildest places in the in the world. And so I would have been, had I had the finances back in the, in the 1920s to be able to do such a thing, I'd have been there. Mm. I would have probably did, had to do the same thing that, that I did, which is move to that place, and I would end up be, I would have been a guide. Right. In search right. of that, that adventure. Right, um, I could see that. Because yeah. that's what I had to do, because I knew, uh, well I didn't, first off, I didn't even know what a doll sheep was when I moved to the Yukon. But I just was, look, I knew that I needed wild places in mountain environments that nobody else that I knew had ever been to. Right. So that was the allure for me. There and, are so many pioneers in this industry that have made what we do today possible too, yeah. right? I mean, to recognize that and to understand that and, and you know, pay homage to it is, is incredible. And I think, you know, for your purposes, your role, you're inspiring so many people out there to do the things that you're doing as well, right? To get out there, to get fit, to get into you know the 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 you know the mindset and the the, the attitude that you know you know I can do that as well. I can get back there. I can make this happen. You don't necessarily have to be an adventure racer. No, it definitely yeah. helps. But I mean, you're inspiring a lot of people, and you're paving that groundwork as a pioneer yourself in that way, right? You know, doing it in a modern in a modern manner, of course. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, but because I like like to to your point is you don't have to run the Yukon Arctic Ultra like a 700 or 430 mile race in the middle of the winter to to just move your you don't have to do that right. to experience and to want to be better mm -hmm. right because I mean and to go out into the backcountry and experience these amazing right. vistas and you don't have to be that. But you, but you do have to put yourself out of what in modern times is the comfort zone. Yes. And, and that's why Denise and I have created, my wife has, has created the Power Hunter Fitness Program to, to let people know, okay, like it's achievable right. by anybody. And I did, um, it all started Regardless with- Regardless of where you're starting yeah. from, right? And, and, you know, and that's the whole point. You yeah. improve a little bit, then you get you know, new things open up to you. And the, 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 the things that you get exposed to hunting in the backcountry that are so unexpected, you yeah. know, from trip to trip are just, that's what makes it, part of what makes it so special for me in particular, right? And I know the more I put into it, the more I get those experiences and that exposure. And it's, it's not gonna be the same as what you're doing, 
but it's going to be new and incredible for me, yeah. right? And every time out, it just gets a little better. I had the opportunity to do a desert hunt, a mule deer hunt, bow hunt this year, and you know, uh, in, in a place where I didn't even think deer existed, right? And it was harsh. I mean, it was hot. It was over 100 degrees. Yeah. Dealing with cactus and choya and, and all sorts of you know hazards and and. It was incredible, it was yeah. beautiful, but it was hard, right? And I had to push myself in. You know, I would have never have gotten that type of experience if it were not for hunting. Right? Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't mean to change the no, subject a little bit. I, no, I think that's really important. It is about those ex those experiences, but it has to, it starts with, you know, for, for you, you know, you're fit too, and you get put yourself in that environment, and you can, you know, the challenges are, are different. The challenges, and, the environment is going to bring its own challenges, mm -hmm. right? But the fitter you are, the less those challenges become and the more you can focus on the hunt. Right. So that's right. where, uh, like, Denise and I created, like, this, you know, when, like you were mentioning, I walked down into my basement and I slapped the, slapped the poster, the, the do the work is, the, is fundamentally the motto to me. And I do, I put a, you know, post a 10 minute workout every day because that's literally all that it takes to start to change your life mm -hmm. is 10 minutes and everybody on the planet has 10 minutes right. a day because if you can if you say i don't have 10 minutes a day to invest in myself physically mm -hmm. then you're you're absolutely lying to, to yourself and you're lying to everybody else yeah. Yeah. so that's where it starts with that 10 and i've i got buddies how the 10 minutes of do that i'm gonna go off on a so I really want to. I really want to enforce this point: is the 10 minutes of do the, of do the work for me started when I went on a moose hunt with my great six great friends, childhood friends. Okay. And we they convinced me to uh, to to take them on a moose hunt, and and this is a two years ago now. And we went on this moose hunt, and it was the, the, it was a great time. We ended up taking this moose about 600 yards up the mountain behind camp and it was and it was and it was amazing because everybody got to the moose and we're talking a variety of guys mm -hmm. think of your six best buddies and they're going to be all shapes and sizes right right and they are and and, and i grew up and, and, and i grew up in a in an athletic world so these are six guys that i played hockey with mm. right mm -hmm. and now they're all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. right and me, me being the skinniest of everybody. So, so now we're packing this moose off the mountain and we all got back to camp and it was like, to me it was like the light bulb went off. It's like, this is a snapshot of physicality out there. Right. So I got, it was a great time. I got home and I was thinking, come on, how can I help my buddies? Right. Because everybody's approaching 50 years old mm -hmm. and Honestly, some of them were in, were, were in trouble. Right. And I said, how do we start, the, how do we, what do we need to do? And I talked to Denise and we said, everybody's got 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I got on a, on a you know, group chat with, and we all, I said, listen guys, why don't we all as a community help each other, keep each other accountable, we're gonna, everyone, there's seven of us, we're all going to do a, a make a 10 minute workout every day, body weight workout mm -hmm. that we don't have to have any gear. Mm -hmm. And let's let's start there. We're now a year and a quarter later. The whole team is continuing changing guys lives like everyone, like more energy. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like like the relationships are better. They're happier. Mm -hmm. You can you can just see, and this is 10 minutes a day. And some of the guys just do 10 minutes. Right. But I mean, the physical effects of 10 minutes, and they all did the program, the Power Hunter program as as well. And now they're not just, um, but they're eating. Some of them maybe they're only doing 10 minutes. Some of them are doing more. Um, it was it was. It's so rewarding to me to see the most unhealthy guy of of them all. Um, he, uh, you know, he posted, not only are we gonna do 10 minutes, he's challenging guys to do more. Right. So right. It's, it's a testament to where it starts. And that's what I mean. 
10 minutes is all it takes. Mm -hmm. Start there, just start. Yes. And then, you know, if you want to do more and, and it's about backcountry hunting, and it's about being, you know, strong in the, in the field, you know, uh, that's why we created the Power Hunter Fitness Program. I think that also says a lot about your buddies, right? I mean, you know, when I, when I hear that story, I think about, you know, like the guys I've hunted with, right? You know, and I think about, you know, what makes a good hunting partner. You know, and I've, I've had the fortune of always going out with guys that I think are, are more physically fit, more mentally fit than I am, that are always challenging me, right? I'm always kind of the, I always feel like anyway that I'm, I'm like the dead weight, even though I know I'm not, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, but it, it, it makes me think about that. And, and you know, when, you, when you're in the backcountry with somebody, having this experience, right? And it's, and, and it's, you know, it can be a dangerous experience, right? It can be, you know, you can get yourself in situations that, you know, are, are gnarly, you know, and, you know, and, and, and difficult and where, you know, some guys, if they're not mentally, mentally strong, could fall apart, right? So, you know, that's what I think of when I hear that. And, and I'm curious from your perspective, you know, what makes a good hunting partner, you know? What do you look for? Do you hunt with other guys that you haven't hunted with before or aren't really familiar with? And then how does that, I mean, yeah. you, you've obviously been a guide before, so yeah. you've probably got a pretty pretty good awareness of, or a strong opinion, I'll say. Yeah, that. so I definitely have a strong opinion on what makes a good hunting partner. <laughs> but um, I'm, in a, I'm in a unique situation in that, like, I expect, I expect a lot mm -hmm. from the people that, uh, that I hunt with. Um, whether it's my father and he's 76 years old, mm -hmm. Or whether it's my son that's seven, mm -hmm. I expect a lot from I expect a lot from both of them. Mm -hmm. And if it's a if it's a hunting partner that we're you know we're uh, now I'm behind the there's the cameras that are right. often involved <laughs> with with my I shouldn't say often all the time I don't. It's got to be motivating in its own right, right? I mean, it's, you can't you can't have a power hunter program and 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 you know and the claims that you have and then have cameras on you and not deliver so yeah it's it, the whole camera thing brings a unique perspective to it but prior to um, to put it into you know your average person's idea of a, of a good hunting partner so what i look for um, is first off it's got to be they got to be physically fit because the mountain and it's it's number 1 mm. Like, and it's gotta be comparable to mine. Mm. Because if you have one guy that's super fit and one guy that's, that, you know, is, is really lagging all the time, mm -hmm. the mental strain on the guy behind just trying to keep up is, is its own battle. Sure. Yeah. And then you start to add the elements of, of mother nature to right. that, and that battle gets lost. Like mm -hmm. that individual just loses the battle. Mm -hmm. um, my wife often, like she's a great runner, like, but when we're both super running fit and in our, in our racing days, it's like, and you know, she would, she would just, she's just there to just to try to keep up. And then maybe I would stop and I'm navigating or something. And then, and then they catch, the person catches up. And this is what happens in the mountains is the guy that's fit goes ahead, stops, rests. The other guy catches up, the guy that's fit, rest. he's ready to go. Yeah. And and then that guy doesn't get any rest. I've experienced that. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it, and it's not that that if if you have one guy that's super fit and is not aware of his partner and I guess awareness mm -hmm. and awareness of what is the goal here. Right. And that's where great teammates with a teammate a team uh, you know a good team attitude that's where adventure racing for me was so powerful mm -hmm. because if you and I are on a team um, we don't win this race until we all cross the line together. Right. And right. that's ultimately you want to choose people that are of similar physical ability. But there are times in adventure racing when I can I show up at the start line and can be the strongest guy in the team. And then two days into it, I'm the weakest guy on the team. Mm -hmm. And you're carrying my backpack. Right. Like you have a pack on your back and you have one on your front. Right. And maybe a tow line hooked to my waist. And you're pulling, you know, you're towing me. And yeah. when you can, and, that, and that's very ego, you have to be able to let go of your ego. Mm -hmm. So when I look for teammates, I look for teammates that don't have a huge ego. Mm -hmm. 
that, that can understand what it is that we're trying to achieve together. Right. Like, if, and what the reality of the situation is as well. I mean, if you're at risk in a particular situation and being able to handle it and understand it and not yeah. trying to fight it because of your ego. So it, there's so many things that come into the, the team aspect of being successful on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of it. Like if I'm lagging behind and you're, you're leading the way, you stop to take, take a break, I catch up to you and you take off, it's demoralizing. Yeah. It, it's like, yeah. like, I'm going, come on, man. <laughs> like, like, give me a well, break it here. It can be for both too, right? Yeah. For both people. Frustrating for the guy in the front yep. and demoralizing for the guy in behind. So really trying to find those teammates first off that have physical comparability and, um, and dedication yeah. to it. Yeah. You have to be shooting for the same goal. Like you don't, you don't show up to a, an adventure race and one guy is, just wants to finish the race and the other guy wants to win. Well, that's not going to go well. No. <laughs> like, you have to have the same, the same goal in mind. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where, where it starts. And it starts with the physical fitness being uh, in line. Well, let's tie things back to the show a little bit. Yeah. Back to our world here where we're at. You probably see a lot of people walking around here, walking behind us. You know, a lot of noise going on. It's I think, I think, we're, I think we're actually, people are not wanting to walk behind because they don't yeah. want to cut into the camera. Quite a few people have avoided <laughs> us and some others have, have gone yeah. on. So let's talk gear here real quick for a second. You know, we, we, had, we haven't talked about boots yet, yeah. right? And so, you know, let's talk about boots. Let's be, let's be uh, I'll be a little selfish here and say, hey, I want to talk about no, this is this is easy. your experience. So. This is easy. I don't know what your question is going to be, but I know that I can answer it. <laughs> Well, I, you let know, me I'm not start. Really sure. Yeah, I'll let you okay. start. Go for it. Then, uh, you know, what's working for you? So I've been I've been in the mountain hunting world for 25 plus years. Yeah, and um, I've tried and used like some great boots, and I've tried and used some boots that are um, like catastrophic. Mm. Could could almost be catastrophic. Uh, on on most hunts, but it's been a lot of years and trying a lot of different boots. Certainly since I've come into the um, into the the hunting television scene, and it was when we first we first met. I I approached I approached you know the booth like this. I think it was at the Shot Show. Yes, and that's where we first met and. You said, Greg, try the, try the boots out. And I was like, yep, I'll try the boots out. Because I, I would never put my name to a pair of boots or put my support behind a pair of boots that I didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. And I run a lot of boots that I didn't support, could never get behind. Right. And it was um, this, this boot, your company, was so refreshing to me. When, when, I, um, when I put them on and I used them in some of the most difficult hunts, uh, hunts out there mm -hmm. with, with zero issues. And you have That's a right. number, and, and not just one pair of boots. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I've put some boots to the test. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is a, this is where the testament to you is, is any, any places where I felt that they could have been improved, mm -hmm. you guys have acted on it immediately and said, we're gonna make changes. Right. And that's where I know that I'm with the right partnership mm -hmm. and with the, because, yeah, so I'm no, gonna get no back, I wanna get perfect, back to, right? no product is perfect. Right, and you have to. You have to have the mindset as well. I think, you know, we're in our 94th year this year, right? And we're still family owned. It's 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 a niche, you know, market that we serve, right? And the attitude of the brand is, you know, no corners cut, right? It's it's the family name on the product. And they want to make the best product they can. Yeah. And if it's not working, and this is this is a tribute to Marco Zomberlin more than anything, right? In the Zomberlin family. He I mean, this is what he does. I mean, I I'll have conversations with him on the phone. Like, hey, you know, we had a customer come back with this issue on the tow box or something like that, yeah. you know, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, then a couple weeks later, I'll fly over to Italy before our meetings and he'll come up to me and be like, here's the new boot. How do you like it? How does it, you know, let's do some testing. Who can test it for us? Let's make sure it's right. 
right? And it's, it happens that fast, wow. right? It's that quick. And, you know, and when you've got your CEO as your chief bootmaker, right? Yeah. And, and Marco Zombrin is really making quite a name for himself. I mean, he's come so far in his time as CEO of the company. Yeah. But it's that mindset, it's that attitude of, we're going to do the best thing, we're going to do the right thing all the time, right? And, and that's you know, how you succeed. We got guys like Greg out there. We've got other people on the, you know, on Everest or wherever they are. Yep. You know, they're they're putting themselves at risk, and you can't you can't afford a catastrophic failure. That's yeah. just not acceptable. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, trying kind of to get back to where I want to go with this is because it's it's exciting to me because it was mm -hmm. a long it took a long it took a long time like it took a long time to find that that partner in in Zomberlin that I could really feel comfortable in saying, you know mm. what? It's n it's not just the product, but it's that attitude. Yeah. That attitude toward perfection. Yeah. Toward we're always trying to like you have the similar like the company has a similar attitude toward me. I just want to tell me what I'm doing wrong mm. because I want to be the best that I can be. Yeah. And and when you have a company that has that same kind of mentality, it's uh, and produce a product mm -hmm. that is is amazing. It took us a long time to get going as well once we started working together to really get going. Yeah, <laughs> if I recall, I mean, because it's because you you it's, it's almost like a dance, right? You're feeling each other out, and you're, totally. You know, I wanted you to be comfortable with the product, and you know, we wanted to be comfortable with you, and so on, and and get that right fit. So and and, you know, and things have you know evolved very nicely. So yeah. We're super excited to be working with you and, and you know what you represent and everything we talked about today. No, really, it's just, that. I mean, it's such a great fit with us. So if you had to choose one boot from Zomberlin to use on the mountain, what would it be? Yeah, the the ultimate, and, and I I grabbed it off the shelf, like the ultimate, the ultimate boot for me is, um, is your mountain trek. Um, I can't find a fault in this boot. Mm. And we, we put it to the test on three goat hunts and a sheep hunt this year. And I've had, like, I can't even, you know, I, I can't go into all of the problems that I've had with other, other boots. But this one, with, and with other brands, but this, this certainly, this boot here, if in the mountain environment, it to me is, is the top of the food chain. Mm. The, from the sole, and the style of like the the amount of grip that this sole has. We got to wrap this up, apparently, and unfortunately. But at the end, because because yeah. this is where I get excited talking talking about this here this here yeah. boot in particular. Um, I highly recommend if you're looking for a boot for mountain hunting that will cover every different aspect of mountain hunting whether it's wet, whether it's dry, whether it's steep, whether it's uh, shale, rocky, whatever, this thing performed. Mm. And man, I'm loving the fact, and it goes back, I'm sure glad I'm not wearing a pair of like slippers like they were using back in the 1920s, <laughs> and I have this because right. literally, this is a Come piece of circling. equipment, this is a piece of equipment that can keep you in the mountains to right. finish the hunt, yeah. and then after that, it's up to your physical ability yes. and your mental ability because this thing to is not going to fail you. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to be thinking about your boots in the mountain at and all. I am never a hard sale. Mm. Like I've never been the guy that hard sells on anything, and that's. But for me, it's exciting. Yeah. Because Great. I've. It's been five, six years of searching mm. to find this boot. Mm. That's exciting and that's what's for us. exciting for me, because yeah, this, yeah. this is easy. This is easy for great. me to just to sit here and say, "This is it," because I know it's it. Well, fantastic! Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your partnership and your friendship. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it too, and um, the great Greg McHale folks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, folks.